this world, there is real evil. In the darkest shadows and in the most ordinary places. These are the true stories of the innocent and the unimaginable. Hey! For Clara Dandy, life in the country promises peace and hope. But in her new house, these things are hard to find. Something sinister lurks in the woods and stalks her family. Clara relies on her faith and on the sixth sense of a respected psychic to fight a legion of lost souls. Between the world we see and the things we fear, there are doors. When they are opened, nightmares become reality. For nearly 200 years, the town of Hinsdale, New York, has had a kind of rural charm. Far from the concrete and crime of the city, the mountains keep their secrets. For Clara Danby, Western New York is a rural paradise. Her family has vacationed here for years to escape the stress of their life in Buffalo. That's it, I told you, see? We figured the country was our redemption. We seemed to get along better there, and I thought, well, maybe we should move to a country place. In 1970, a real estate agent suggests they look at a house for sale in the town of Hinsdale. When we saw the house, I can't really describe the feeling we had because it was so peaceful. And the air, the air was like breathing in champagne. It was, it was great. It's on eight acres of land. Beautiful tree, beautiful mountains over there. They have come across. The house is over 100 years old. Clara and her husband, Phil, are impressed with the house. It was gorgeous. It wasn't modern or anything, but it just glowed. It was just perfect for us. It was just perfect. Let's go. I'm going to show you around. We thought, OK, this is a good place for the family. Look at the nice stairs over here. The children, 13-year-old Tina and 14-year-old Mike, are excited about the move. Buffalo's a tough town, and I'm not a tough guy. I was very much into wildlife, and so that was like just perfect for me. That's where I wanted to be. It's a wonderful home. OK. Beautiful house. I'm sold. <laughs> Thank you. Alright. What's that door for? Oh, uh, let me show you. That's a cross space of the house. I'll show it to you. So what's in there? Um, it's like a storage. It don't be open for Here. a while now. We can do okay. this all the time. Okay. Don't have to worry about okay. it now. Um. <laughs> this thing is stuck. Probably hasn't been open in a while. The crawl space was weird to me. It gave me a funny feeling. But I thought, OK, you know, it's just your city upbringing. And... Clara thinks it is strange that there's a fireplace in the storage area. A few months later, the Dandy family moves to the country. Phil plans to commute to his job in Buffalo, 70 miles away. On move-in day, Clara's brother arrives at the house a few hours before the rest of the family.
What's going on? I don't know, sis. Look, I came here. What so is that? There were bees. They were all over the window in there. I mean, this place was, it was flooded with them. I mean, so I went ahead. I called the exterminator to come out here. He said he'd never seen so many bees in one place. And it wasn't the time of year for them to swarm. So I thought, okay, this is one of my first lessons. I'm going to have to learn with the, to live with this because this is the way it is in the country. Life in the country is very different from Buffalo. Clara is grateful for the change. <laughs> it was very calm, very peaceful, and it just seemed ideal for us. I guess I should have known that things were too good. You guys sure you're, a few weeks right later, way? Mike explores the woods with his new neighbors. I guess so. So you guys ever get lost around here? No way. We know these woods like the back of our hand. Which way is my house? Up there. No, it's that way. We could find it if we had to. What was that? Probably nothing. We saw a tall teenage boy walk past us with a gun. Hey, this is private property. That's a ghost. What? We wanted to catch up with this kid and say, what are you doing on our property? I could not explain how he could have just disappeared. Come on, it's just... Pa, Lama, you won't believe what we just saw. Hold on just a second. Hey, hold, hold on just a second. We saw a ghost, Mrs. D. It's like a guy disappeared. So I was preoccupied with what I was doing. I, I should have listened. I couldn't be bothered with a ghost. Hey, a few weeks later... Up? Clara has forgotten all about Mike's story. You hear that? Did you hear that, Madison? No, no. I stopped and I listen and I hear this chanting. No. I said, I know I hear. No. No. I felt surrounded by something. The reason I say that is because things are a little crazy around here without you, you know? Clara's husband oh, calls from his workplace in Buffalo. Oh, you can't? She tells him about the strange sounds she heard in the woods. I don't know that he was disbelieving, but he didn't entirely believe either. Okay, all right, I will. Okay, bye. So I was losing his support right there. Is everything okay? 
Yeah. You all right? I heard this, uh, the strange sound today. I went up to the woods and there was a strange sound, like a Gregorian chant. Above our farm like was a campground. Yeah. I just thought, well, it's the campers. You know, there's campers up above there. Come on. My mom said she heard the chanting over this way. I decided to go up into the woods and find out what that was. The older of the neighbor boys decided he'd had enough. Matt and I were the skeptics, so we just kept going. It was slow going with the denseness of the underbrush. I don't think anything's gonna happen. Matt tries to meditate, thinking this may help him to contact the supernatural. Not getting anything, Matt. Just concentrate. Did you hear that? What was that? I, I don't know. It sounded like an axe hitting wood or something. You know, where you, where you heard the chanting? And while we were up there, we closed our eyes and we heard... We heard a sound like an axe thudding against wood. And then we heard a girl screaming. You went up there? Just said, well, you know, stay away from there. Whatever it is, we don't want to know. Just stay away oh, from that it. Hurts. Oh, that hurts, that hurts. You know, that is what you get for going poking around when you're not supposed to. At that time, I'm getting a little mm, prickle in the spine saying there's something wrong. I'll take this plate to the table. Yeah. Clara and Mike try to dismiss the strange experiences they've had in the woods. All right. So we had a great life, other than these weird things that happened, and it was too easy to explain them away and say, okay, that's all right. You know, maybe it's just something I don't understand. Yeah, me too. Can I get some of those? Thank you. All right. We want to do test the burgers over this way. Yeah. Tina, 
Mike, if you want to go into town, you better get a move on. Let's go. Is there anything from town? No, I think I'm just staying. Read my book. Okay. Relax. Bye, guys. Have fun. Bye. Bye. Sweetie. We shouldn't be long. All right. Hey, Mike. Hey, Mike. Hey, Mike. I looked and the window was still open. None of them had fallen. A few nights later. Absolutely no way that I can come up with any physical explanation. There's no gravitational shift or vortex that can cause something to come from the bottom of the pile and leave the top on there. Mom! Mom, can you come in here? What? My... Mama, Mama, I was sleeping and, and that, that, this chest that, and the checkers, they, they fell on me from under that stack of magazines. It fell from right under there. Mike is very logical. And this didn't make sense to him. Clara fears that whatever has been lurking in the woods is starting to invade her home. It was like, like, you know, all these strange things. Like Clara turns slamming. to her faith for answers. She yeah, contacts no Father Al, out. a Catholic priest at a nearby university. But Father, this thing with Mike, I mean, he's running around scared now. But I had to find out he's answers so somehow so I could fight whatever this thing was. And uh, the only way to go was find a professional, somebody who had studied this. He really is. For years, Father Al has counseled people about experiences with the paranormal. Something is trying to get into my house, and I sense that it's already in there. It could be a poltergeist haunting. That's where external forces exploit psychic energy created by the family. Then they come out through one of the family members. I thought there was more to it than that. From anything I had read, Poltergeist had no motive, no mind behind it. And this seemed to. Would you like for me to come by your house tomorrow and say a mass? went to a Catholic school and I was quite confident my faith could take care of it, whatever it was. I'm 
is. It really bonded us closer in a way because we were together more for support. We were all quite sure this was it. And we wouldn't have any more problem. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. One night, while Clara's husband is away on business. This figure passed by, and I thought it was my daughter. Tina? What's by the window? A woman with stringy hair. She's gone, sweetie. Whatever it was, it's gone, okay? Okay. Clara okay. realizes that the priest's blessing was ineffective. It's gonna be okay, my love. I thought, wait a minute. I've been taught that this works. I've been taught that a priest can come in and say a prayer and, the, you know, everything's okay. It did not work. Father Al, may I help you? Father Al, it's still happening. Yeah, this, no, Tina, Tina just saw something in her room. Some, some, Everything I had I, ever I believed know. in suddenly was crashing around my feet. Perhaps I could uh, ask him to Father Al promises that he will bring a paranormal okay, expert to the house as soon as possible. Log, I wrote, um, I'm writing down everything that's happening because it's, it's not stopped. In the meantime, Clara Thanks. knows she must keep her family calm. Thank you, Father. All right. I'm going to stay in control of myself, and if I can do that, then they'll be able to stay in control, too. That weekend, Mike is out with friends. 
Tina is asleep. Found a dirty condenser back here, Mrs. Hay. I cleaned it up for you, no charge. I certainly hope so, considering your problem. What? Heard something. Phil and Clara hear something outside. Raccoons. Tina? Did you see that? Go! Just go! Go, 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 go! Tina? Tina? Tina! Tina, she's not responding. Phil! Oh my god, Phil, look in her eyes. Tina, are you okay? Tina? 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 Tina, let me talk to me, please. Am I going crazy? No, you're not going crazy. I'm in defense mode. I'm in mama bear mode. Don't mess with my kids. You know, I was starting to get mad. I'm going to check. Don't leave this room. if he can spend the night at a friend's house. No, 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 I don't think you can stay late. When his mother tells him what's been happening, he rushes home and brings his friend Randy with him. He's shaken. He's pale. He almost like he can hardly keep his hand on the steering wheel. I said, what's wrong, Mike? And he's just said, well, things, things are going on at the house that I can't understand. My father's running like a chicken with his head cut off because he's going to do battle with whatever's happening. Are we reaching some kind of communal psychosis or something? What's happening? Quiet, quiet. Wait, it's in there. It's quiet, quiet. The overhead lights go out, even though the power is still on in other parts of the house. I hear scratching. I know, I know. It's the cross Fireplace have been stacked in the middle of the floor. No, nobody's been in this room. Oh my god. It took some doing to cart all those bricks all the way across the crawl space. Oh my god. I thought, oh no, this. I thought, I can't fight this thing. Whatever it is, is too strong. to the house 
accompanied by Alex Tanis, a respected psychic whose abilities were studied at the American Society for Psychical Research. Alex Tanis was a real presence. When he looked at you, he, there was an intensity. It was like he was looking into your soul. The family leads him to the crawl space. This is where the noise came from. Please, please, don't tell me anything. What do you see? I see bodies. used to be a stopping point for stagecoach passengers. What I'm getting is that someone nearby robbed and killed the travelers. Their bodies were placed in the crawl space until they could be buried. I sense the presence of seven different spirits. It was freaky, it was really scary, and I, I thought, man, we got the guy, this is the guy, this, he knows what we're, what we're talking about. Let us pray that these souls might find release. has renewed hope. The house feels more peaceful. Whatever his presence did, it calmed the place down. Mike and Randy are skeptical of the psychic story about the murdered travelers. They search for okay. proof of an old stagecoach so, route near the house. Okay, so. According to the map, the stagecoach went through here. You yeah, see, the track goes all the way down that way. They see a strange light in the tree. I couldn't breathe. Something was pushing against me. Almost like somebody's having you in a bear hug, squeezing you. Mike! What's going on? Where have you been? Randy and I, we went into the woods and... Mike was... We were out there, we found an old road. Oh, you know, Lord, like you know, something's there. going on. And while we were out there, we saw these, like... These orbs of light in the trees. We gotta do something. We gotta do something. I said, what? What on earth can we do? Honey, it's dangerous. We've gotta do something.
Go. Go inside, guys. Just go. Mothers deal with, you know, cuts and bruises and falls and homework and stuff like that. They don't deal with things that can't happen, and that couldn't have happened. Clara fears that there is nothing left to do but move out of the house. But this seems like an unrealistic solution. There was really no place to go. We had sunk all our money into that house, and I didn't want to be beaten neither to the kids. A few days later. Yes, are you Mrs. Dandy? Yes. Do you have a son, Mike? Yes, I do. There's been an accident. We just took Michael to the emergency room. It was bad. He has a serious head injury and a ruptured spleen. We're taking him to surgery now. He was bleeding so bad, they said they'd have to remove his spleen. Excuse me. I'm sorry, folks. I know it's a tough time for you. Yes. In the ambulance. The state troopers who had gotten him out of the car said that Mike had said someone was in the car with him. We searched for a passenger, but we're unable to find anybody else at the scene. I, he was by himself. Mike wakes up from a coma. Mike, can you hear me? Mom, I, I can't see. Mike, just don't move, honey. I'm Mom. getting a bad accident. Maybe I was clutching at straws. Maybe I wanted somebody to blame. But Mom. my gut reaction was that whatever was in the house had done something. Father Al and psychic Alex Tennis return to the house to make one final attempt to end the haunting. I'm going to try and decide the house. Confession is good for the soul, even after death. Obviously, there are some spirits here that feel they have a story to tell. Okay. God bless you, Father. We'll be fine. We'll be fine.
The psychic has a vision of a young girl. He senses that she is in pain. also senses the presence of other spirits. At some point, there was a boy of 18 or 19 who entered this house. He is deceased now, but his energy is here. here too. I am deep dead cold now. And the chill grows stronger. The psychic has a vision of one particularly angry spirit in the room. The energy young woman is telling me she does not want to leave. The woman used to lock herself in this room and not come out. She does not want the other energies to leave. No, you must leave. You must leave. No, the answer is no, you must leave. You cannot stay in this house. You cannot stay. Let go. Let go. The psychic and the priest Please, must try to release the negative up. energies in the house. We'll start by holding hands. The priest prepares for a common exorcism, the most extreme action that he can take on his own authority. Now release the energy that is evil. He said there were multitudes of entities there whether these were people who were murdered there, I don't know. He didn't say that, but uh, that was the implication, that they must have been the people who had been murdered there. Let us pray. I think Father L considered this his last chance to get rid of whatever was there. And I think he pulled out the big guns. Defend us in the conflict which we have to sustain against Prince. This was the culmination. This was going to do it. Against the spirits of wickedness and high places. It had to work this time. Come to the rescue of man whom God has created to his image and likeness, and who he has redeemed at a great price from the tyranny of the devil. Cease by your audacity, cunning serpent, to delude the human race, to persecute the church, to torment God's elect, and to sift them as wheat. This is the command made to you by the Most High God. Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered and let them hate him. Flee from before his face. As smoke vanishes, so let them vanish away as wax melted before the fire. So let the wicked perish at the presence of God. God, the Father God.
What I remember was the feeling of, wow, they've got to go. I mean, this, this is strong. This is powerful. Amen. Yeah, after the ceremony was over and the dust had settled, the place was blissful. It was the way it was when we moved in. For several months, the Dandy family lives in peace. But within the year, the haunting begins again. The family is forced to move. Unable to find a buyer for the house, they declare bankruptcy. Clara has come away from her experience, conflicted about her own religious beliefs. I have trouble believing in anything anymore. I really do, because I think formal religions, maybe each one of them has a little bit of the truth, but none of them have it all. And not enough of them admit that this type of thing happens. Forsaken 19th century mansion harbors angry spirits from the past. There was definitely something there, and it felt like it didn't want us there. Get out. Rumors of a deadly love triangle. The banker was having an affair with her. One of the speculations was that she was buried in the basement. And a dark entity with the most evil of intentions. Whatever it was wasn't human. <laughs> It frightened me so bad. I can't even describe the terror. Some houses are better left undisturbed. In America, there is real evil. It lurks in the darkest shadows and in our most ordinary towns. Between the worlds we see and the things we fear, there are doors. When they are opened, nightmares become reality. In the heart of Decatur County lies the small town of Garden Grove, Iowa, where the Rice family, Norman, Jennifer, and son Andrew, has just purchased a 19th century Victorian mansion. It wasn't hard to fall in love with. It was an amazing place, and I always said, you know, someday I'm going to own you. Someday you're going to be my house. I wanted to live there. It had everything that I ever wanted. better than the pictures? <laughs> it's incredible. Just looking at the outside of the mansion, it's breathtaking. It has a commanding presence. Hey, well, what do you think, Andrew? We're going to live here? <laughs> <laughs> at that point, I would have been about eight, nine years old. We were moving from a farm. And uh, I was kind of excited, you know, new house. It was really big compared to our old one. It was really just a nice house. I'd never seen anything quite like it before. Built at the turn of the century, the mansion was commissioned by an affluent businessman and his wife. 
Garden Grove was in its prime, having served as a shipping point on the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad. Garden Grove, Iowa, back in the 1800s, was the place to be. It was one of the major cities. There were several thousand people that lived there because the railroad came through. It had a, a, a nice, long downtown area with lots of shops and, and bakeries and haberdasheries. And so that's why they chose that, is it just, it was a beautiful place, still country-like, but city-fied. And Jennifer feels an instant connection to the house. The house just kind of felt like it belonged to me, like I'd known it at some point in time. It drew you in. But the picturesque mansion hides secrets from the past. Within these walls, it is rumored that an unspeakable horror took place. Isn't it grand? I mean, look at all the details. <laughs> look at this staircase. Very clearly, before we even moved in, we knew it was a money pit. It's incredible, but don't get too crazy. Norm, it's got to be done right. For the company I worked at, I actually got a lot of stock options. So we were kind of planning on using that money to put into the house. So we were fully prepared to dump a whole bunch of money into it. I feel like I'm the one who was meant to restore it to its former glory. Now, honey, I trust you. This is your passion. Pretty reasonable. I think Norman, more than anything, just knew that I loved that house. Are you sure you're OK with this? Yeah, if, uh, if you're happy, I'm happy. In the months ahead, Norman spends most of his time working for a software company in Arizona, nearly 1,300 miles away. This leaves Jennifer alone to manage the big job of renovating the old house so that her family can move in. With me being out of town, it, it kind of gave her something to do since we were apart 90% of the time, being in different states. Her being able to put all of her energy into restoring this house really gave her a sense of accomplishment. Jennifer hires a main contractor named Claude and a few other workers to help realize her vision of the old Victorian mansion. It just, it was a mission for me. And I could just see what it should look like. And that's what I loved about having that house. I could just create it from basically the ground up into what it should be and what I loved. Claude was putting in a chandelier and the ladder was shaking okay? so hard he wasn't sure if it was him shaking it or if there was something shaking it. You could tell he was just freaked. Wait, what happened? I, I don't know. I was pushed. What do you mean? Who pushed you? He never really told me what it was that happened. He just was very exaggerated in his speech and his nervousness. What are you talking about? I don't understand. I, I have to go. He actually told me, I don't want to be in this house anymore. Jennifer is stunned. It's as if Claude has just seen a ghost. I told my wife I was going to be working in this house. Uh huh. You know what she said? You no, know what? Stay out of the basement. What? Why? You know about the basement, right? No. That's where you buried her. Who? The servant. The woman he was having an affair with. She was pregnant, and he didn't want nobody to know. 
Then they had an argument. Then she fell down the stairs. He didn't want a scandal, so he buried her down there. I think a lot of the creepiness and the fact it's sort of banded for so long, it did. It sparked a lot of, of rumors. And the rumor was that the original owner buried her in the basement. Eight-year-old Andrew's curiosity gets the better of him. First, he saw a man in the window. And now, the scandalous rumor leads him to the basement. I couldn't even fathom everybody knowing so much about a house that I had just moved into. But it was kind of cool at the same time. feeling I got was immediately like someone had just dropped a bunch of bricks on me. It was just really heavy, dense air. It was kind of hard to breathe a little bit. I can remember it being damp. It literally smelled like wet dirt. In 2001, Jennifer and Norman Rice, along with their eight-year-old son, Andrew, moved to Garden Grove, Iowa, to restore their new home. The historic mansion is haunted by rumors dating back to the early 1900s of a suspicious death and a secret burial in the basement. Rumors had spread around town like wildfire that a servant had broken her neck. Some had even speculated that the owner was having an affair with her. Since he was prominent, he couldn't have that kind of thing on his record. So one of the speculations was that she was buried in the basement. never went back down to the basement again. I had thought maybe it was a skeleton grabbing me from underneath the ground. Maybe because I'd seen too, one too many horror movies as a kid. By July 2001, the majority of the renovations on the house are complete, despite the fact that all of the contractors have deserted the job. With Andrew's father, Norman, frequently away on business, his mother has no choice but to finish the house on her own. I remember her having so many stressful nights because we would bring in contractors to try to fix this place up, and they would just leave. Jennifer suspects that it has something to do with the rumors surrounding the house but she doesn't believe the old wives' tale. It was somewhat unnerving, but it was an amazing house, and it had amazing potential. And that's all I could think about for a while. It didn't matter what people said. There's always going to be rumors, especially in small towns. <laughs> but as time wore on and some of the things that happened, I began to wonder. I started hearing noises I really couldn't explain. Andrew? especially late, late, late at night. You don't really think things through. Some of it could be written off to being tired late night. It's it, the creepy factor.
Sleep tight. It is now the late summer of 2001. Norman is still working full-time 1,300 miles away in Arizona, while Jennifer and Andrew adjust to the family-friendly Garden Grove, Iowa area. One night, Andrew invites his friend Cody for a sleepover. Ah, oh, yes! I remember Cody, when I looked up at him, he just points at the top of the stairs. <gasps> Next thing we know, he just vanished. In the beginning, everything was roses. Home sweet home. You know, we'd spent all the time fixing the house up. But it didn't take too much longer after that to realize there was something off about the house. I chose to ignore a lot of things because I was elated and it was my dream. By the summer of 2001, Jennifer Rice has completed renovations on an abandoned 19th century Victorian mansion in Iowa. And while the home's rumored history of a mysterious death merely lurks in the back of her mind, her son Andrew comes face to face with evil. After that had it happened, Cody had never spent the night again. And as a matter of fact, he really never even talked to me ever again. Despite his terrifying encounter with the ghostly entity, Andrew decides not to tell his mother what he saw. I didn't want to worry her because I didn't know how she really would react to it at the time. So I just avoid the subject altogether. In September 2001, news that the once dilapidated mansion has been restored begins to spread through the small town of Garden Grove, Iowa. We had people that would knock on the door. I'm sorry to bother you, but I just, I've always loved this house. Or I, I knew so-and-so who lived here and I always wanted to see this house. And we finally decided we would do an open house. I just want to thank you for opening your house to all of us. Oh, well, thank you for coming. As we're doing tours, this sweet little old lady started telling me that she was so pleased to see somebody finally working on that house. My great uncle is the banker who built this house. And then she explained that she was the great niece. I know he would be very pleased to see how you're caring for it. She'd watched over the years how people came and went and left it sit and rot. You could tell it broke her heart. 
and he and his wife would have been very happy to see a child growing up here. Oh, well, that's my son, Andrew. Please come in. I have something for you. The great niece brought a beautiful scrapbook full of pictures. And she showed us this picture, lovely picture about yay big, of the original owners. Jennifer is struck by the image of the husband. It was just an old black and white yellowed photo, but you could tell he had the palest blue eyes you've ever seen because you could barely see the pupils. Then Jennifer suddenly recalls the rumors surrounding the man and the Victorian mansion. Did you ever hear any of the rumors about this house? That's what they are, rumors. Don't believe everything you hear. Of course not. What happened was they married later in life. Did they have any children? Oh, they wanted children so badly. <laughs> so they didn't have children. And you can tell they planned on having children because there was a child's room adjoined to the master bedroom. That's my son Andrew's room. Andrew, come here, sweetie. This nice lady was just telling me that her great uncle is the one who built our house. Very pleased to meet you, Andrew. Y you too. Oh, and look at what she brought us. As she's showing us all these pictures, I started realizing that I had seen the banker somewhere before. This is the man I saw the first time I went in the house. And then again at the top of the stairs. I, I, I need to go help Dad. Sorry. I don't even know what that was about. Scared and confused, Andrew continues to keep his experiences to himself. I was just in a kind of state of denial, really, because I just was thinking, oh, well, no, no this is really happening. I just remember pushing it out to the side, pushing it off to the side, because I didn't want to even try to rationalize it. This was not something that I could just tell somebody, because they, unless you're there, you really can't fix it. So, I mean, I kept this to myself as best as I could. visit destinationamerica.com. Since his terrifying encounter in the basement, eight-year-old Andrew Rice has felt an unsettling presence in his 19th century house in Garden Grove, Iowa. At that point, it scared me so much. I would just go over to a friend's house, or I'd go walk down the street and go play at the park. You know, I'd just find any way to avoid the situation altogether. But after seeing old photos of the original owner, a once prominent businessman, Andrew is now convinced 
that his ghost is haunting the home. His father, Norman, who is often away on business, is completely in the dark. My job's extremely stressful trying to do software development and traveling too, and so they wanted me to be more concentrated on my work and not have to really worry too much about the house itself. They didn't really talk to me about it at all. A lot of times my dad was out of town, so he had no idea what was going on. One night, Andrew has a new visitor. When I looked up, I saw this lady just sitting in my rocking chair. At first, Andrew is stunned at the sight, but then he recognizes who she is. I had seen the lady somewhere before. It took me a minute, but then I realized it's the banker's wife. Banker's wife. She was sitting in the rocking chair in my room. He said I saw a ghost. He was very shaken up about it. It's okay. Maybe you're just dreaming. You can really scare yourself when you're alone by overthinking things. We were very used to being alone, and I think we tended to underthink things. No, I'm serious. She looked exactly like the photo. It was her. And that's not all. I've seen the banker, too. Maybe they're friendly ghosts. They always wanted to have children. And your bedroom was supposed to be the nursery. <laughs> Maybe that's why they're drawn to you. Or that's why they come to you. Mom had told me that she wasn't there to harm me, more so she was watching over me. So she just said, oh, don't worry about it. You want to sleep in here tonight? Despite Andrew's compelling tale, Jennifer isn't entirely convinced that the house is haunted. I didn't want to believe that there was anything going on. I just didn't. I'm stubborn. I'm very stubborn. And if I don't see it, it didn't happen. It is now January 2002. Andrew and his mother have been living in the house for seven months while his father is often away on business. But that winter, Norman returns to Garden Grove and is told nothing about his son's encounters with ghosts. I'm so glad you're home. <laughs> it just wasn't something that came up, you know? I didn't really feel like starting a, gee, I think our house is haunted conversation. But one night, a dark force decides to make its presence known. Norman? <laughs> something picked us up, <laughs> and we landed on the bed. <gasps> We were both wakened at the same time by some black entity, uh, just some ominous presence. What was that? You, you felt that too, right? Yes. There was no way to rationalize it. There was just no way. It was unexplainable. So that was the first time I, I hadn't been able to just explain it away. This isn't something that happened by yourself. We're both sitting there talking about the same thing that just happened, so we know this was real. This was no dream. And now, Jennifer can no longer deny the truth. Norman, I have something to tell you. 
I think the house is haunted. By what? Ghosts? Uh, yes. A banker and his wife. They lived here in the 19th century. Andrew's been seeing them. Jennifer kind of starts hinting at things that had been happening to Andrew that I wasn't aware of. There's a rumor around town. The banker had a servant girl who was pregnant. I will have you thrown out. You'll starve in the streets. She died here. And they buried her in our basement. In our basement? Why'd you wait so long to tell me? I thought if we ignored it, it would just go away. But now this? We both felt it. There's something here. You just want to pack up and leave? No. There's nothing more to talk about, is there? It made me feel like this is all my fault. But we, we didn't talk about it. It was, it was frustrating. It was isolating. I felt alone because I didn't want to talk about it and stir it up. But now that the secret is out, Norman begins to dread spending time in his new home, where he suddenly feels unwelcome. You almost feel like you're going into a depression, thinking, OK, we've spent a lot of money on this house, and now do you want to admit that somehow a house can say, I don't want you here? Although he doesn't believe in ghosts, Norman can't shake the unnerving feeling that he is not alone. And that something still lurks in the basement. Walking in that basement for the first time, you know, basements can be scary, and this one definitely was. It just kind of gives you the heebie-jeebies. There was some ominous mass there keeping the light from shining into the basement. It was like something just sucked the light out and it was pitch black. That had to be the most scared I ever was in that house. Rice family has been living in a haunted 19th century Victorian mansion in Iowa, plagued by dark secrets from the past. Their presence in the once abandoned house has stirred up angry ghosts still roaming the property. But that home, a new evil spirit, is unearthed from deep inside the house, and Norman has a terrifying encounter in the basement. Instantly, something in him begins to change. It's as if the evil force is taking over his body and his soul. It felt like the longer I was in that house, just the more angry I could get at nothing. Uh, anything at all could set me off. I don't know if it was the house changing me, or was it just me? 
As Norman became more agitated, more angry, more sullen, reclusive, the things in the house manifested more, more strongly. It scared me. I was just getting numb to everything because it was just getting worse and worse. And at this point, I just started not feeling anything. But fortunately, Norman's job soon takes him out of state on business for several weeks. His absence comes as a welcome relief. I just knew that there wasn't going to be another day of yelling and screaming and wondering what was going to set him off. I was happy when he left. I mean, that's the very sad part. But with or without Norman, little do his wife and son know they are not safe. The evil spirit has been awakened. We had just gotten home from Sunday church, and my friend from down the street, he would always call and leave me a message after he got off of church so we could go hang out and play. Honey, what are you doing? It's broken. No, it's not. It's not even plugged in. The light was blinking, just like a normal, somebody left a message. So I don't know why I did it, but I pushed the play button. Out of that came a noise. Whatever it was wasn't human. But as I turned it up, you could hear very clearly. You could tell its intention was to make us leave. I was, I was scared. At that point in time, I was scared. Terrified, Jennifer reaches out to her last resort, the church. Weeks later, a group of parishioners arrive to conduct a house blessing. The evil immediately lures them to the basement. In the name of Jesus Christ, we dedicate this home as a sacred edifice. They were around the basement leaning inward with their Bibles while they were praying. Lord, we ask that you protect this home so that Norman, Jennifer, and Andrew Rice can worship and grow spiritually in peace. Amen. 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 Afterwards, the parishioners retreat. They do not speak about their experience. They were very visibly upset. They did not want to talk about it. House blessing is now complete, and Jennifer has faith that it will make a difference. I honestly believed that it would be better. I really did, because he picked the strongest people in our church, the most steadfast people I knew. I was very hopeful. I had felt maybe it could get better. But at the same time, after going through that for so many months, I had learned just not to get my hopes too far up. With her husband Norman out of town, Jennifer tries to remain strong for Andrew. Norman? My mind is like, what, what? I know he is not here. Norman, is that you?
for well over two years, angry ghosts and an evil spirit have been haunting the Rice family in their 19th century Victorian home in Garden Grove, Iowa. In the fall of 2003, while her husband Norman is out of town, Jennifer wakes to the sound of heavy footsteps in the hall. Norman, is that you? Norman? <laughs> I saw that thing. I didn't know what it was, and then it looked at me. I can't move. It's going to get me. I'm feeling like I'm going to die of a heart attack. I can't even describe the terror. <laughs> I knew then that it could create whatever it wanted to to scare us. But this new entity is just starting its reign of terror. And soon, it targets the weakest member of the family. Up. The best way to describe it is I saw this bat head almost. It was just this huge black form. I feel this presence in close around me. It was just strong, and I knew that if I had struggled, it would have just tightened his grip even more. All I want to do is get to Andrew. That's my first thought. I've got to get Andrew and run. I'm just, I want to get out of here. I want out. Come on, baby. Come on. She didn't even grab her shoes. She just picked me up. We ran out the door. Come on, Andrew. Come on, sweetie. It's okay, sweetie. It's okay. I was too scared to look in the back seat, you know, in the rearview mirror, because I was afraid that thing was in the car with us. Sorry, sweetie. That was it. I was done. I couldn't do it anymore. We needed to sell it and, and move. Finally, in November 2004, after three years of terror, the Rice family sells the 19th century Victorian mansion. I was heartbroken, naturally. It was my dream. But I knew my family just had been through enough. So I had to say, sorry and start all over again. We admitted defeat. We were cutting our losses. But then after we sold the house, and even now today, I'm glad that we did. It seems like getting out of that house played a big role in getting our family back on the right track. Family is definitely more important than any house. After we sold the house, everything seemed to return to normal. Where we lived was just a nice, calm little house that didn't have any worries. And my dad just started feeling my dad again. Still, even years later, Jennifer is unable to let go wanting answers about her family's terrifying ordeal. It had been probably five years. I just guess I wanted to find out whether or not this really was just about my family or was it related to the house. So I knocked on the door, nobody was there. And to this day, Jennifer has not been able to determine if the new family has experienced anything paranormal. What happened to the Rice family in Garden Grove? And what, if anything, lies buried in the basement remains a mystery. I think that thing saw a source of power that it could draw from. 
I was feeling fear, my mom was feeling stress, my dad was feeling anger, all those are negative and it gave it something to feed off of. I think that the worst of it came from the turmoil in the family. This thing, whatever it was in the house, had to break us up. It had to get between us. I just hope that no one else ever has to go through the same thing that we did.